Howdy everyone, and today I'm testing out another Nikon lens, and this time it's one of the most popular in their lineup, the AFS Nikkor 50mm f1.4 G. It's for Nikon's digital SLR cameras, full frame or APS-C, but it can also be easily adapted onto their new Z mount mirrorless cameras with the FTZ adapter, and that's what I'll be doing today. It costs just over 400 US dollars, or just under 400 pounds here in the UK. Everyone loves a fast 50mm lens. On a full frame camera, their 50mm focal length is neither wide angle nor telephoto, making them useful for all kinds of photography, and a bright maximum aperture like f1.4 lets in loads of light for snappy shutter speeds and dramatically out of focus backgrounds. On an APS-C camera, their focal length is the full frame equivalent of 75mm, giving you a much tighter field of view, which is handy for portrait photography. Currently, there's no native 50mm f1.4 on Nikon Z mount mirrorless cameras, and the current Z mount 50mm f1.8 lens is quite large and expensive, costing over £500. So, if you own a Z6 or Z7 mirrorless camera and an FTZ adapter, then getting a copy of this f1.4 lens for digital SLRs is potentially a really nice option, especially considering that the FTZ adapter works so well with Nikon's G-type lenses. Its optical design is a tiny bit old-fashioned, but it does include an extra glass element towards the rear of the optical system, which should hopefully elevate its image quality a little higher than other, relatively inexpensive, 50mm f1.4 designs. Well, we'll see about image quality in a minute. First though, let's look at build quality. This is one of the first Nikon lenses I've handled, and for a mid-range option, it actually feels quite nice. The lens mount is made of metal, and it's surrounded by a weather sealing gasket. The main body of the lens is made of plastic, but it looks and feels quite good. The rubberized focus ring is precise enough, and can be turned at any time. Here's the autofocus motor at work. It goes at an average speed, making a little whooshing noise that will only really be noticeable if you're shooting video and you're recording sound with your camera's microphone. It worked quite accurately with my Nikon Z7 camera and FTX adapter, although sometimes the camera's eye autofocus feature focused too closely and missed. That's mostly just a problem with the camera though. When it comes to focus breathing, the lens zooms in a little as you focus more closely, which can be another minor annoyance for video shooters. The lens has a 58mm filter thread, and it comes with a lens hood as standard. The lens does not feature image stabilization, although a lot of Nikon's newest cameras have image stabilization built into their sensors, so that meant it worked really nicely for me with my Nikon Z7. Overall, the build quality is nice enough considering the lens's price range. It's certainly a lot nicer than the equivalent old Canon EF lens, although in fairness, that is a much older piece of equipment. Alright, let's move on and look at the all-important image quality. I've mounted it onto a Nikon Z7 here, with its very demanding 45 megapixel full-frame sensor. Image corrections are turned on. In the middle of the image, we see pretty good resolution, although the lens isn't bitingly sharp here. Contrast is slightly low as well, and purple fringing is a little noticeable, although it's not as bad as on other 50mm lenses I've tested. Over in the corners, the image is softer and contrast falls apart quite spectacularly. There's probably quite a problem with coma going on here, in common with other older 50mm lens designs. We'll look at that more closely in a second. Let's stop down to f2. There's barely any improvement in image quality in the corners at all here, although the middle of the image now shows some better contrast and greatly reduced purple fringing. Stop down to f2.8 for some very high resolution in the middle, and the corner image quality improves very dramatically. Those corners are very sharp at f4, and they stay this sharp down to about f8 and f11. If you stop down as far as f16, the image will finally begin to soften again due to the effect of diffraction. So, on a full frame camera, we're getting quite typical resolution for a fast 50mm lens here. Corner image quality is very soft, until you stop down to f2.8. But what's noteworthy is that the overall contrast is a little bit higher than on other, older lens designs. 
Okay, I'm going to test the lens on an APS-C camera now by showing you results from a Nikon D5600 with a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor. At f1.4, sharpness in the middle of the image is fairly high, but that purple fringing seems very noticeable. Corner image quality remains poor. There's a little improvement at f2, although the purple fringing back in the middle is now mostly gone. At f2.8, image quality in the middle is excellent, and the corners look a bit clearer now, too. f4 sees a slight improvement, and image quality at f5.6 is perfect across the entire image frame. Stop down as far as f16, and softness appears again due to diffraction. So, it's a fairly predictable performance on APS-C, the lens is not so hot at wider apertures, but stop down the aperture for quite gradual improvements. Ok then, let's examine distortion and vignetting on a full frame camera. It's a very average performance here for a 50mm lens in this class, we see moderate pin cushion distortion and heavy vignetting at f1.4. Vignetting doesn't really reduce much at f2, but corners become bright at f2.8 or f4, so you should definitely use in-camera or software corrections. Next, let's look at close-up image quality. The lens configures down to about 45cm, again that's very typical for an optic in this class. Close-up image quality is extremely poor at f1.4. It's only slightly improved at f2 but it's significantly better at f2.8, and f4 finally looks pretty sharp. Now let's see how the lens performs when working against bright lights. We see a notable drop in contrast, and an average amount of flaring here, not a great performance really. And while we're working in the dark here, let's check out coma levels. In the corners of your images, bright points of light will display some absolutely explosive coma smearing, it doesn't get much worse than that f2 is just as bad, but it's reduced at f2.8, and at f4, it's finally under some kind of control. Now, let's take a look at bokeh. Slightly out of focus backgrounds will look a bit jumbled and unpleasant. Deeply out of focus backgrounds look much nicer, albeit with some rather prominent green highlighting on brighter points of light, so not really a great performance here. And related to bokeh is longitudinal chromatic aberration. If you can actually see this picture through all the lenses ghosting and low contrast close up, you will note that bokeh highlights look strongly green behind the plane of focus and pink before. It stays the same down to f2.8, although f4 does look a little better. Overall then, well this is a 50mm f1.4 lens with very very typical image quality for an older design, with all the optical technical problems you would expect. For those willing to spend a bit more money, there are much better options available to you out there, for example the Sigma 50mm f1.4 Art is very good. But still, I note that this lens's images have a little more contrast to them than its older contemporaries, well if you don't shoot too close to your subject, that is. That'll contribute to you getting some more dramatic images, and anyone using a lower resolution full frame camera, like the Nikon Z6 or another of Nikon's 24 megapixel full frame cameras, will be much more satisfied with its overall results. And the lens's build quality is quite nice, it's certainly enjoyable enough to use. If you use this lens within its limitations, it'll be useful and get you some pleasant images.